All right, welcome everybody to the sixth episode of the Young Nurse Churches Committee in Ref webinar series. Today's topic is neurooncology or neurosurgical oncology. The title of the talk is Pursuing a Cure, Why I Chose Neurosurgical Oncology. We uh, have a, an amazing set of distinguished guests and panelists today. And so welcome and we will get to the talk shortly. Uh, before we do, just to kind of give everyone an orientation to why we're all doing this, um, we're, we're trying to provide students and residents and young neurosurgeons with timely information, education, and inspiration towards a career in neurosurgery, particularly in these relatively isolating times where we're not getting to see each other in person quite as much as we used to. Um, what is the YNC? We're a committee of the WNS. <clears throat> the WNS is a national organization, a neurosurgical organization. What we do is provide representatives to the WNS leadership, as well as we develop future leaders of neurosurgery and provide a channel for young neurosurgeons to impact the direction of the specialty. This is at us at a meeting a few years back now. That's why there's no masks, as you might imagine. So what is the INREF? So the INREF is the philanthropic uh, and nonprofit arm of the WNS. It um, stands for Neurosurgery Research and Education Foundation. It's a 501c3 organization. Uh, it supports basic science and clinical research as well as lifelong education to foster improved outcomes for our patients with neurological diseases as well as funds many of the educational courses that residents go to including i went to one myself which was extremely extremely beneficial for me as i transitioned from a pgy6 to a chief here um, so they are sponsoring this event as well <clears throat> before i forget i want to remind everyone next week uh, is actually not next week it's two weeks from now we're taking a week off next week thursday november 19th um, we're going to have a talk by Dr. Eli Levy and Renee Reynolds from University of Buffalo about grit and resilience in neurosurgery training. Um, and please join us for that one. If you need to get any more information about these things, you can follow us on our social media at Young Neurosurge or at Young Neuro S, uh, both Instagram and Twitter. Also, uh, the first five webinars um, had a pre-survey and we're just mailing out a post survey. This is very important for us to understand how we're doing, what we can do better, what topics you need to hear, uh, if the format is suiting everyone's interests and needs. Um, and so please, 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 if you get a survey, um, fill it out. I know some people have been, they've been filtering these surveys into their junk mailbox. So please check there if you haven't received one and you have watched one of the prior episodes. All right, with that, we'll start introducing our guests, Dr. Rao, who is Ganesh Rao who's a Mark J. Shapiro Professor and Chair, Residency Program Director in de the Department of Neurosurgery at Baylor College of Medicine right here in Houston, Texas. He's also my boss. <clears throat> uh, he has a basic science laboratory uh, focused on modeling and malignant gliomas and GBM. Um, I guess that's kind of a little bit redundant. Um, National Institute of Health uh, funded lab, um, extremely accomplished in both basic science as well as clinical neurosurgery. He's also the immediate past president of the CNS another amazing accomplishment. <clears throat> Dr. Zada, he is a uh, former, or I guess I should say alumni of the Young Nurses Committee, prior uh, vice chair, I believe, right? Um, he's also uh, very accomplished in his own right. He's a professor of neurological surgery, uh, as well as the associate Re residency program director and the director of the USC Brain Tumor Center at USC Keck School of Medicine. He also has a science laboratory um, at the, I'm not sure how to say that, Zilka Neurological Institute. He also has NIH funding for his work uh, and welcome both of these very distinguished gentlemen uh, who maybe share the same barber, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, we also have tremendous panelists today. Um, Dr. Siva Kumar, who is uh, with the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. His practice is uh, open vascular, tumor, cranial. Um, and he's also the secretary of the Young Nurses Committee and will become the chair um, in the spring. Dr. Debraj Mukherjee, uh, MD, MPH. He's the uh, director of the medical students here at the Young Nurses Committee. He also is a faculty at, at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, finally, Saqib Huck. Um, he's a medical student, MD candidate, class of 2021, also at Johns Hopkins um, with an interest in brain tumors. Uh, he knows Dr. Mukherjee well, and he's our missions fellow on the committee. And we welcome all three of you guys as committee members. So. It's great to have all of you here. Finally, um, our, one of our co-founders who has done a lot of the hard work behind the scenes to make all this happen is Anna Rodriguez. Um, she's also a medical student interested in neurosurgery for the class of 2026. And we welcome Anna and thank her for her contributions. And she'll be helping us with questions towards the end. Um, so I'm gonna stop my screen sharing here.
and um, I'm going to open it up for anyone that wants to make any more comments. But if not, uh, we'll have Dr. Rao share his screen and give us his thoughts on why he, his journey through his nurse to where he is through neurosurgery and why he decided to go into neuro-oncology, why maybe you should too. And, uh, and, and kind of get a feel, get a feel for, for why he, why he would choose this. Great. Uh, thank you, JJ, for that great introduction. Is, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I think this is a great opportunity for people to kind of hear from um, Dr. Zada and myself, um, how we got to where we are. Uh, in my case, it's not, it was a very circuitous route. So I'm happy to kind of share my path here uh, through this. So uh, I sort of subtitled this my fairly unremarkable path to neurosurgery, or, or if, if I can do it, probably anybody can. Um, I did not go to a Ivy League school. I am a blue collar dude. I went to the University of Arizona for undergrad and med school. Uh, when I applied many years ago, and I'll tell you when it was, I had one publication. I had a pretty good step one score. I did sub eyes at uh, Barrow, Utah, New Mexico. Um, I interviewed at 12 places, I didn't rank one of them. And I think there's a lesson there um, in terms of, you know, if a, if a program is not a good fit for you, um, I know everybody's super competitive and want to be a neurosurgeon, but there, there are downsides to ranking places that you may not fit in well. And there was one place, like I just knew when I went there, I met people that it was not going to be a good place for me. Uh, I ended up at the University of Utah, which, you know, ended up being one of the best things uh, in my life, actually. So, so why did I choose neurosurgery? Uh, I am not one of those people that knew I wanted to do it when I came out of the womb. I know there are people like that, but I'm not one of them. I, I went to med school actually because I thought I could do research and be a clinician. Uh, pretty early on, I think when you go to med school, you kind of get these these um, you, these decision points where you know you sort of follow a path. And I knew I liked procedures, so. Um, I knew I was going to do something like that, something in surgery. Um, I effectively will that every other specialty. I rotated on ENT, ortho, uh, urology, and, and I just, you know, was always led back to neurosurgery. Um, a big disadvantage for me was that my neurosurgery or my, my medical school did not have a neurosurgery program. So Arizona does have one now, but at the time did not have one and just had a very kind of general neurosurgery fellowship where they took um, kind of four medical grads to to do fell to do like an unfolded or a, rather a, a gen general neurosurgery fellowship. Um, so I really didn't have residents I could ask about. You know, what do you have to do to get in that sort of thing? Um, and in fact, I was the first med student in my class. Uh, I was the first person from my school to go to go into neurosurgery in five years. So I had nobody, you know, immediately before me that had navigated this path. So. I was pretty clueless about everything. I really had no idea what it took. And neurosurgery back then was an early match. So you did it outside of ERAS. You had to apply through a totally separate um, mechanism. And so, you know, we would find out in January where we matched. So, you know, I sought out advice from, from mentors. When I did these sub eyes, I would ask people questions. I mean, it really took me, a, um, I had to catch up fast in terms of figuring out how to do this. And I say this not to like make it sound like it's, I'm actually saying all this to make it, you realize that, you know, for many of you, you've got the advantage of being able to reach out to, to people and get advice on things like this. Um, I think this is a great forum uh, that the Bell has put together with the Young Neurosurgeons Committee. And so, you know, take advantage of, of these sorts of opportunities. Um, you know, many years ago, more than 20 years ago, when I applied, you really just had to do well in school, do well on your USMLE step one, do some quote unquote research. Like I said, I had one paper and get good letters of recommendation. Now I can tell you it's much different. So, you know, as a program director, it's, it's getting harder and harder to, to identify good candidates, primarily because, you know, med school grades don't mean much anymore. They're pass fail. Step one scores are going to go away soon. So it's hard to, you know, that's a useful tool, I think, primarily for cognitive abilities. But it doesn't predict how good a neurosurgery resident you are. It really only predicts if you're going to pass the neurosurgery boards, but it, there's some utility to it. Most programs don't use it as a sole criterion, but it is something that, ha that has some value. I think research now is a must with publications. Um, you know, it's, it's not enough to have one or two things. You know, most of our successfully matched applicants have many, many research experiences. If you look across different specialties, dermatology, plastic surgery, radiation oncology, the very competitive ones, 
nurse surgery far and away exceeds those specialties in terms of the research experiences people have. So I've actually changed my tune on this. I used to tell interested applicants, you know, if you have a few papers, it's fine. You don't need a year of research. I, I, I will tailor that discussion to the applicant depending on their, their particular situation. But I do think that it's something you have to consider now. You know, we've, we have a medical student training program in our, in our program, and I, I will often um, can counsel people to, to consider that. Uh, Sub-internships are a must. You have to do away rotations, uh, and that's primarily so you can audition at a place, but also that, you know, you can identify, you may, you may think that the University of wherever is a great place for you, and you may go there and realize that it's not, um, and that's important to know whether or not you'll fit into a culture at a certain place. Letters of recommendation are extremely important now, um, and, and particularly external letters to see how you fit in with a group of residents, that sort of thing, and on your personal statement, I, I actually read all of these. Um, I look for personality, humility, a compelling story of why you want to be a neurosurgeon. I, you know, most of us are get tired of reading about how fascinated by the brain you are, but we, we want to know what, what drove you to this field. An ability to handle adversity and something that tells me you can commit to the arduous training. You know, even with the 80 hour work week, uh, residency in neurosurgery is very hard and it's very long. So it's something that I want to make sure that people have uh, a commitment to and, you know, um, I was glad to see that Dr. Levy and, and Dr. Reynolds are going to talk about grit in your next session. I think that's actually a very important topic. So I'm just, you know, I, I put this together very quickly. Um, JJ wanted me to talk about how I got to where I was, so I dug up some old pictures. So again, I got into residency. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew I, I liked research. I thought it was actually very important as a physician to have some research component. Um, I had not done very much at all, but I was very fortunate, you know, where I, I trained at the University of Utah and Bill Caldwell was my chair who has like something like 600 publications or something ridiculous. And he, he really lit a fire under all of us to kind of, you know, if you saw something unique, you, you would write it up, you know, and you'd get in and that sort of sparked, you know, all of us to, to, to start writing and turn that into case series and, and that sort of thing. Um, I really had no idea how to do it, but I, I learned how along the way. Uh, residency was really some of the most challenging times of my life. I was always tired. I was always irritable. Um, but you know, you get through and, and I think everybody here on this panel will tell you that the friends that you make in residency, you know, it's a bond that you cannot even imagine, um, that you think back to these times. And these are guys like Adam Arthur, who's now like a big name in, in vascular neurosurgery that I would, I would have never believed back then that would happen, but it did. <laughs> uh, Paul House is a buddy of mine, was at Utah now in private practice. Peter Can, who's now chair down the road at UTMB, uh, and there's me with, um, a full head of hair. So. It is, you know, the, 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 it's challenging, but these friendships last a long time. Um, so I developed a research focus. I gravitated towards brain tumor research because I really like the scientific aspect of it. The one thing about neurosurgical oncology is, um, you know, the outcomes at the time for certain things were terrible. And if you look at, if you read sort of the old, you know, the guys in the field, the people that pioneered the field of neurosurgery, Harvey Cushing, Walter Dandy, and you read, you ask why, and you, People ask them, then, why do you want to go into this? I mean, neurosurgery back then, early 1900s, was really not considered a field um, because the outcomes were terrible. Um, and you, and the, the comment that was frequently made back then was that it had to get better. And so I sort of thought, felt the same way, like, surely we're going to make, you know, make inroads in treatment of glioblastoma and some of these other terrible brain tumors. And I wanted to be part of that. So Fortunately, at Utah, Dan Fultz um, and, and Wally will, will know Dan well. Um, Dan was an unbelievable surgeon scientist who was a real gentleman, had a great lab, um, and was just down to earth. And I really clicked with him and spent two years in his lab, had a couple of uh, papers come out of there. Um, it was really great. But even after that two years in the lab, I didn't feel comfortable starting my own lab. I knew I would need additional mentorship as a faculty member. And you know, going into, into, into neurosurgical oncology, this is 15 years ago, even at the time I felt like I needed a little bit more validation. I needed my ticket punched, so to speak. So I pursued a fellowship at uh, MD Anderson. Um, at the time, there were really only two options for tumor fellowships. It was Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson. I interviewed at both and I just happened to like MD Anderson better. Um, and again, as I mentioned, I, I really didn't feel like I had the skill set in my lab to start my own practice. Um, or my own lab, um, I felt reasonably comfortable with most, most neuro-oncology neuro um, procedures. Um, 
so why did I end up doing this? I mean, you know, again, um, the pros, I thought it'd be nice to have a dedicated and focused year in neuro oncology. Um, it was really a less clinically demanding year. It was really focused on cancer. I didn't have to worry about trauma or subarachnoid hemorrhages or any of that other stuff that I really didn't want to do. And I got to know some key players in the field and that really helped. I mean, it's a small world that really does help to know um, people um, and you never know how that's gonna help you or you're gonna help them. I, I think it's very important um, to really maintain these relationships. There are some cons, of course. I mean, in, in this fellowship, I really felt like I learned everything I could in the first six months. The last six months, I was kind of looking for jobs and really not, not growing too much. It did cost me a year of earning. I mean, at that point, I was at PGY8, um, you know, and all my friends were out, you know, working and I was still a fellow. And at Anderson at the time, and a lot of fellowships are still like this, you're, you're sort of a glorified super chief resident. You're not, you know, some fellowships are different. You, you do have privileges, you can do your own practice, you can do your own cases, um, but uh, that was not the case when, during my fellowship. So again, you're sort of, you know, kind of stuck in this mode. And at that point, you know, for me, I was in my mid thirties and I was like, I gotta, I need a real job. I gotta do something. Um, like an adult. So it was a little bit stressful at the end, but you know, I'm glad I did it. I don't have any regrets. Uh, but then, you know, part of that process is the job search. And I will say it's very difficult in neurosurgical oncology, but it's also difficult in skull base. It's also difficult in open, open vascular. I mean, neurosurgery is becoming more competitive um, and job openings are difficult. And so at the time, there were three academic programs hiring for my particular area of interest. They were very different opportunities. Some of, them, some of them, all of them wanted me to have an academic focus. They were all offering me the opportunity to have a lab and that sort of thing. But the amount of work they wanted me to do on the clinical side varied. So some places want me to cover three or four hospitals. There was a lot of variability in salary. There was a lot of variability in startup funds. Um, startup packages and protected time were quite different. In the end, I actually chose to stay at Anderson the salary was actually lower. The startup was not as generous. It was a better fit for me. And I think that's something that we all have to kind of make a decision on um, on our own. Um, the reasons I chose Anderson really, despite not making as much money or not having as much lab research or uh, startup funds is that the environment was better. I didn't have to cover three hospitals. I was really just gonna be at MD Anderson. Um, Ray Sawaya, who was my chair at the time, just is a real gentleman and, and I knew that he would have my best interest at heart. That's, that's another important consideration is your, whoever your chair is, he or she really has to be an advocate for you, particularly if you wanna have a lab because there are some trade-offs that have to be made with your clinical responsibilities and, and working in the lab. Your, your time spent in the OR to a chair is much more valuable than it is in the laboratory, but the lab brings credibility and, and personal satisfaction, professional satisfaction. The chair has to understand that. Um, how did I get that job? I was really in the right place at the right time. They were hiring, there was an opening there. This is more often the case than not, particularly in oncology, that, that maybe a program is expanding or somebody's left, somebody's retiring. Uh, we've, you know, I've, at Anderson, we train three to four fellows a year. So I've been through this cycle for the last 15 years of having very, very impressive people scramble to find jobs. Um, and it's hard, right? The job opportunities are rare. Everyone likes to do tumors and everybody thinks they can do tumors. And I'll tell you, you know, for the people on this panel who are in, in this field, we all know that that's not true, that we see the glioblastomas that are partially resected on the outside or the partially resected, you know, whatever come to our clinics. And it's, 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 it's frustrating, but, you know, that's, that's sort of how it is. Competition is fierce for these jobs. In some years, it's feast and some it's famine. Last year or two years ago, there were a lot of neuro-oncology jobs for some reason. So we were actually able to get our fellows in good places, but there have been times where our fellows have not been able to get what they want. Um, even my job at the time was not perfect. I was offered a position that had a fair amount of spine oncology, which I'm not a huge fan of. I don't love it, but I, I embraced it in a way and, and made it part of my practice. It was initially about 50% of my practice, but then I was able to reduce it to about a third of my practice, which um, was good. Um, to have a lab and run a clinic and be in the OR, you have to figure out your priorities. You have to figure out how to divide your time. Um, that was and balance your career with your home life. I, you know, I got married during residency, and, and my wife and I have twin boys who are now about 12 years old, and and that was that that's was always difficult. My, I'm very lucky my wife understood academic neurosurgery and, and the challenges that came with it, but figuring out how to, how to budget your time um, is something that frankly, I still, still a challenge to me even now. 
Um, when I started, I think there, there are some key things that you all should think about if you're, if you're going to do this and have a lab. Um, startup funds are important. You, can't, you cannot do this without some financial support from your chairman or from your department of the hospital because you have to hire people to do work. Um, I was very lucky. I was able to hire a postdoc. Uh, this is somebody who just happened to be moving to Houston uh, with her husband who had a real, you know, a, a very solid grounding in science um, and, and, you know, was willing to work with me even though I was a nobody. This is a very challenging thing to do. Most, most qualified postdocs when they're coming to a, a lab are looking for big names that they know are going to, you know, they'll write them a letter and they'll, they'll be successful. So it's very challenging to do this. Usually people hire a tech or something like that, but they require a lot more supervision. So you really have to kind of, you know, be in the lab and, and check their work. I applied for very small foundation grants, 50 to $100,000 a year, which really helped keep my lab going. And eventually I applied for a K award. Um, and that's a, a mentored research grant that protects your time and, and, and buys a little bit of your time. It's not enough that your chair isn't gonna still want you to do cases. Um, and we can get into the weeds on this at some point, but it, in neurosurgery, the K award mechanism is actually quite favorable. They protect your time at 50% as opposed to, to 75% for other specialties. And that's more palatable for chairs uh, to, give you, to let you apply for that award. But I got some publications out of that and that allowed me to kind of um, you know, get some uh, credibility. I still needed to produce, um, not only clinically, but, but research-wise. And um, this is another lesson Bill Caldwell taught me is you should have several irons in the fire. It's actually quite important not to focus just on what you're gonna do in the lab, but you know, we all see kind of clinical series or stuff that medical students or residents wanna write. It's important to take advantage of that energy. Um, they, they'll get something out of it, you'll get something out of it. And, and especially in academic, it's very important to kind of show this continuous body of work that you're, every year you've got, you know, a certain number of publications coming out, not necessarily in basic science, but that you're still producing. And that's important for, you know, promotion and that sort of stuff. Um, eventually I had enough stuff in my lab to apply for an R01, uh, which is sort of the next step after a K. Um, and yet to do that is always, you know, a group effort. I sought out help of my mentors and other scientists at my institution. And it's hard to do that on your own. It's very important to be collaborative, I think. Uh, my clinical practice during this time really focused on primary metastatic brain tumors. And the primary tumors obviously dovetailed with my laboratory effort. Um, but I also made an effort to write about clinical topics on primary brain tumors. Um, if you're in neurosurgical oncology, you do a lot of brain mets. That makes up a lot of what we do, whether it's open surgery or radio surgery. Um, I was part of a clinical trial that you know we set a standard of care for that. Um, so take advantage of those opportunities that come up. There's there's nothing that you should view as too as beneath you, especially in neuro-oncology. I mean, these are things every every case is a is a learning opportunity, an opportunity to, to you know put a series together. Uh, because I did spine, I was one in three spine call, which I didn't love, <laughs> but I would occasionally crank out some academic projects of this. It was never a real focus on my academic pursuits, but it did keep me, you know, writing about that stuff was still something, again, that fed into my, you know, my, uh, my CV, so to speak, in order to, to show productivity. If I could say anything about this, there's no perfect job. You will always have to do things in neurosurgery that you don't necessarily love, right? We all have to do shunts, you know, depending where you are, you might be on trauma call, um, the redo disc herniation, you know, the redo GBM that, you know, is coming back. I mean, these are all things that we have to do. Um, but, you know, the, the privilege of being a neurosurgeon, um, I think, outweighs these sorts of, of things that, that are part of the job. Sort of mid-career, I'm sort of getting it near the end here, um, was really more focused on my lab. Um, and this may be kind of out of the scope of what you want, JJ, but just to, you know, I think it's important for people to think about this when you're going into academics, you know, you, you, you don't think about it when you're a resident, but then you, you get a job and you're on a clock and you've got to get promoted. And, you know, people are looking at your publications and clinical activity and are you building a national, international reputation? Those are things that you, you don't think about as a resident, but you, in academics, you sort of have to. Um, and it's important to meet with your chair periodically to ensure that you're on track. I think that's something that uh, I appreciated from Ray Sawaya, who made sure that I was, you know, getting um, what I needed. Uh, so my career has changed dramatically from where I started. I mean, my research program required a lot of collaboration. I, I think it's important when you're collaborating to bring something to the table, try to avoid this urge as a neurosurgical oncologist to just be a, a tissue person, like you're bringing samples to the lab, to, to scientists. 
you're all very smart. I mean, you should you should want to know about how these things work. And there are things that I know now that I had no clue about way back when, like you know, genomics and that sort of thing. Um, I took an active role in the educational program. I became a program director. It's a lot of work. Um, I've been able to delegate some of that to Akash Patel, who's one of my associate PD. Uh, and then just a few months ago, I became chair, which is obviously a huge responsibility, and it's curtailed some of my clinical and laboratory efforts. But it's given me a new appreciation for collaboration. And I think if you're if you're if you have a collaborative mindset from the beginning, um, that helps um, to keep these things going. So my lessons over the years: uh, be nice to everybody. Um, as a neurosurgeon, you live at the mercy of referring physicians. You can't just sit in your office and wait for patients to come. That is not how it works. Um, people have to refer to you, and if you've got to be able to, um, you know, you've got to be available and and willing to um, sort through some non-operative stuff, some some not so great operative stuff uh, for the cases. Um, work hard. People notice laziness, especially in our field. As I said, uh, have many irons in the fire, but no one to say no. As I got older, there were some things that I didn't, you know, feel were going to really benefit me, and so I, you know, I I would you know, maybe turn that over to a junior faculty member or somebody else or a resident uh, to work on. Because um, if it doesn't fit with your long-term goals, you, you know, energy is finite and it can really um, um, weigh you down or, 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 or you know, up, hold up other uh, efforts that you might have. Um, don't chase money. <laughs> I've been telling my residents this, you know, the ones that are graduating, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. My starting, I, I tell my starting salary was the, that I took at Anderson was the lowest of the three jobs that I had, but it was just a better fit for me. Um, and it all ends up working out in the end. We are, we are compensated very well compared to other specialties. Um, it's a privilege to be a neurosurgeon. Um, I hope that's something that other, other panelists agree with. I mean, I think that, you know, this is, um, you know, something that I've seen new grads, they really focus on that salary line, not realizing that, you know, when you get promoted or a few years in, that number always goes up and you'll always, you know, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be fine. So um, don't worry so much about that. Uh, the art is long and life is short. You know, this is a Hippocratic com um, quote, but um, 15 years went by very fast for me. Um, and a lot of stuff that I thought, oh, I'll get to that later. I never got to. Um, and, and time and, and time goes by fast, so enjoy the ride. So again, what have I learned? Um, surgical technique, decision making. This is why I went into surgical oncology. I, I, I think that these are things that really um, um, I got out of being in this career focused. Um, I've, you know, I've had to be, learn how to do molecular genetic, epigenetic, and omic um, sort of research. Um, I've learned how to perform clinical and basic research. Um, and the field is way too now broad now for generalists. I mean, I think that. You know, we, we are all, and even the board has recognized the, the focus practices. I mean, we, we, we are all becoming experts in our areas. Um, we all have to do some other general stuff. I mean, we can all do a shunt and take out an epidural, but I certainly can't clip an aneurysm or, you know, some of these other things that my colleagues on the call do. Um, and there's a reason for that. You know, the, there's plenty of evidence to show that the more volume you do of a certain thing, the better you're going to be at it and the better your outcomes are going to be. So I actually threw a case in here, JJ, to kind of emphasize what the point is of this. So I think you asked me to do this, but just real quick. Um, so this is a case that showed up in my clinic not too long ago. 45-year-old guy with no past history. He's traveling from New York back home, and he has a seizure, and he's taken to the ER. And his past history is remarkable for polio. He's got a little bit of a gait abnormality. He's intact after the seizure. So this happens on a Friday. He's in the ER. He gets his exams normal, gets a scan. He's got this right frontal lesion that everybody here will recognize as, a, as a, probably a low-grade tumor. The guy's totally normal, right? And he's going back home. And in the ER, he's told by a neurosurgeon, this is an emergency and you need a biopsy. So he biopsies him on Saturday from the ER and then sends him on his way. He's done nothing for this guy, right? I mean, this is completely the wrong thing to do. Um, and I ended, he ends up in my clinic with a biopsy with a tissue diagnosis that's probably a consequence, you know, wrong because of sampling error. And I end up taking him for uh, a, a frontal lobectomy to take out the tumor, which we now know is standard of care for something like this. You know, I tell my residents never do, there's no such thing as an emergent stereotypic biopsy, <laughs> you know? So I see stuff like this and it makes me crazy, but I think this is, this sort of exemplifies why there's a need for people of expertise in certain things. And, and uh, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks again for listening and hopefully you found that useful. Uh, that's truly, truly outstanding. I, I, I think that 
um, it, everyone, even myself, learned so much from people's journeys and the steps they took and the decisions they made. And uh, I must say that this is a relatively novel. Even as I was training, I didn't really see that often. The steps you go through as a clinician scientist in particular, um, just laid out so simply and just the thought process of each step and, and how you go about the job search and how you integrate into your practice. So I think that's, I think that's actually quite, quite helpful um, and something we haven't heard. Um, that much. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing all that. Um, sure, the, any quick uh, questions or interjections from the panel before we jump over to hear Dr. Zada's talk? All right. I guess with that, we'll just move right on over to Gabriel. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thank you. I think there's a question for Dr. Rao in the chat oh, box. Oh, there is a question. I, one thing I always forget to mention in my introduction is because <laughs> I want to give you guys as much time to talk as possible. Uh, for anyone who's watching, our participants, uh, if you have questions for the panelists or the speakers, et cetera, just put it in the question and answer box um, and we'll definitely answer them at the end, if not during. So uh, we do have one question, so we'll ask Dr. Rao. So Cynthia De La Rose from Mexico, um, he, she asks, looking retrospective in your journey, is there anything you would have done different and what's the most rewarding feeling about your job? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'd have done different. <laughs> Uh, probably pick, the big, pick a big one. The big one is I wish I had started um, focusing on my lab, my lab research earlier in my, when I started my, my first faculty job. The problem is that you get you're so excited to do surgery, you say yes to everything, and, and a couple years got behind before I'd done anything in my lab. And, and again, credit to Ray Sawaya, who sat me down and said, if you don't slow down, you're not going to get anything done and you'll be screwed. And so I, I wish I had just been a little more focused on the lab. The most rewarding feeling about my job right now, um, well, as chair, actually, I will tell you that it's seeing my faculty succeed. So I'm actually thrilled. I've got a great bunch of people that I work with, uh, Dr. Johnson included, who are all, all um, fantastic. So that's seeing my colleagues succeed is probably the most rewarding thing about my job right now. That's a great answer. Right. Bring down, Brittany. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Very good. So uh, we'll move on to Dr. Dr. Zada, and uh, and then we'll we'll have some time for discussion with the panelists as well as the question and answer after his talk. Okay, thank you, Jeremiah, uh, Dr. Rao. That was a fantastic talk, and congrats on becoming chair. Well deserved. Um, Baylor's in really good hands, and uh, and it's good to see so many colleagues that I work closely with on the YNC taking leadership positions. Um, it's, a, it's a great organization and, and subcommittee and uh, it was a great experience for me to go through that as well. Uh, so thank you for having me on. Um, in some ways, my journey parallels uh, uh, Ganesh's very closely and in other ways, it's quite uh, different. So um, I hope I can highlight uh, some of that. I'm, I'm gonna start with the case uh, actually, because this um, to me in some ways highlights um, what's exciting about our field. Um, this was a 17 year old from Hawaii who was going to go play uh, basketball in college, uh, Division II, and then develop diplopia. And um, if uh, for the med students, uh, this is something you'll learn as a resident for your boards. Six nerve palsy with the mass in the clivus, you think of a chordoma. And this um, in particular co was causing uh, um, a compression of the brain stem. And, uh, and as, as um, many of you already know, with tumors such as this, your first opportunity to do the operation is the most definitive in this person's life. Uh, if they go on to have radiation or a second operation or chemotherapy, and uh, the, uh, if you ever have to reoperate on these, it's, uh, it's, it's much harder to do a, a definitive resection uh, and, and uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, the reason I show this case is because it shows how much evolution we see even over the over the period of a few decades in neurosurgery and how how our technology really enables us to do things um these are some of the some masters of neurosurgery from europe who wrote this textbook in the early 90s approaches to the clivus no man's land is what they called it and i just love that because it really was no man's land and this is how people used to get to a tumor um, such as this one uh, this is a slide from one of my mentors ed laws and uh, um, uh, you could see that they used to do what's called a transbasal approach, going through the forehead, lifting up the both frontal lobes, and then going through the sinuses to get to the clivus. Or they used to just cut the face open and do a huge morbid procedure. So imagine if this was your, your younger brother 
your son, et cetera. So obviously we do these uh, endoscopically uh, now, and that, this has really been a game changer uh, in neurosurgery. This is one of, just to be very honest, one of the reasons I went into neurosurgery was the first time I picked up an endoscope, um, a, a guy named Amin Kassam, who's one of the real uh, uh, proponents of, uh, uh, and pioneers of endoscopic skull base surgery, showed me how to pick up an endoscope and, and um, how, what access to the skull base was like. And that was the game changer for me. I, I knew that's where the field was going and um, it was very exciting uh, uh, for me. So, um, so what's exciting about this case? Well, here's the basilar artery, here's the brain stem, here are your little pontine perforating vessels. And you have um, you know, really one chance to get this tumor off this, this young man's brain stem. And, um, and uh, a well done surgery like this, here he is six weeks later, um, uh, graduating from high school, had to have radiation, eventually went on to college. Uh, and here he is two years later, was doing well. Um, this is a very rewarding uh, um, intervention in someone's life. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to say all cases go this smoothly, but we have some cases obviously in neurosurgery that um, where we have to deal with uh, uh, issues that are not as ideal, but um, uh, we, we obviously savor our victories and, and the changes we can make in people's life. Uh, I heard that he did have a, um, a recurrence from a cavernous sinus uh, residual just a year ago, actually, and went on to have additional uh, uh, radiation. But why am I bringing this case up? Um, well, the, the surgery went great initially and he did well and, and, and he did have a recurrence years down the road. But surgery is not the answer. And to touch on what Dr. Rao said, um, to be a, a neuro-oncological surgeon, you have to be invested in the pathology and in what comes beyond the operational considerations. Um, and I think that's what's exciting about it. And um, this is um, one of my mentors, Dr. Marty Weiss. This is the reason I'm at USC. This is the reason Bill Caldwell is, was, was uh, uh, he was a huge mentor for Dr. Caldwell. So many other people as well. But he very early on, especially with pituitary tumors, taught me not, not to focus so much on the technical aspects or about this endoscopic versus microscopic stuff, but what do you do when you're there and what do you do afterwards for these patients to really give them a good outcome? Um, and I'll talk about my journey in a little bit, but um, uh, Ed Laws, who's another mentor of mine, who's currently at the Brigham and who's done more pituitary surgery than anyone else uh, on earth currently, um, uh, he would say, understand the disease pathology. And just some examples here of patients with, with giant non-functioning pituitary tumors. These would be classified as similar tumors um, in many ways, but they're such different tumors in terms of their, their invasion patterns and their, even their, their molecular and genomic characteristics. But um, to really understand why these are different tumors, you have to have a sense of the biology and what's driving these tumors to behave differently. And I got really interested in that early in residency. And uh, it really lit a spark um, in, in what, what has really defined my career thus far. Um, so my path to becoming a neurosurgeon, I grew up in LA. I went to public schools the whole way through. I somehow got into Berkeley and, uh, and majored in uh, molecular biology. And I, I always loved the neurosciences. Um, uh, my career has been essentially in many ways dictated by the wonderful mentors I've had who have influenced me along the way. And I'll, I'll talk about them in a little bit. Um, I then went on to UCSF where I had wonderful mentors and then down to USC for residency. And I did a fellowship at Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. And then I took, um, I looked at a, a, a two jobs afterwards and I, uh, I took the job at USC because um, number one, I love the program and my mentors here. Number two, I got an opportunity to take over Dr. Weiss's practice, which for me was a dream practice um, coming out of training. And I've, I've never looked back. And uh, I, I, I can honestly say um, I've, I've been very fortunate, but uh, um, uh, I don't think I've had any major, um, fortunately, any major missteps with job selection, at least. Um, with other things, for sure, <laughs> not with that aspect of it. So... Um, this was my first mentor in at Berkeley. Um, and for those of you who went to Cal, I, I don't know if you got a chance to work with Dr. Diamond. She studied Einstein's brain in the 1950s when there were no women doing this as PhDs. And uh, if, if you haven't seen The Queen's Gambit on Netflix, it reminds me of Dr. Diamond, of um, a woman 
um, who's well beyond the capabilities of her peers doing amazing things at a time when no one else was. So this is me also with more hair, Ganesh, uh, back in the day, uh, taking Dr. Diamond's uh, graduate level of neuroanatomy class, which I soaked up. She would teach neuroanatomy on a blackboard with pastels. And uh, it was, it was a, a definitive experience for me. At UCSF um, is where I really became interested in brain tumors. Um, Charlie Wilson was several decades ahead of anyone else almost in the country, setting up um, what I still regard as a brain tumor center that um, is a paragon of what brain tumor centers um, can be in many ways. And something that many other centers, including ours, have emulated. Um, you know, there are several other ones uh, uh, out there. This is the one I experienced uh, early on. Um, and, and Dr. Berger had uh, taken the, the reins as chair and Dr. Kunwar was a, is a wonderful pituitary surgeon. And Dr. Quinones, uh, who many of you know, was a resident at the time and, and, and served as a mentor for me. And so all of their combined interests in tumors really got me thinking about this. Um, when I met Dr. Weiss is when I knew I wanted to come to USC and that's the reason I'm still here. Um, uh, I, I hope you'll get a, a chance to meet him for those of you doing interviews. And Dr. Giannata took over as chair when I first got here. And uh, Dr. Apuzzo was also a, a definitive mentor for me um, along the way. Um, uh, a little bit different than, than Dr. Rao. Um, I loved residency. Um, I, my hardest years were after residency. And I've heard many, many, many senior neurosurgeons say that, including Dr. Giannata. Um, that the first couple years after your training can be some of the most challenging uh, for people. Um, the framework of a residency and of, of an 80 hour work week and of um, knowing what your tasks are and, and, and having to complete them and check boxes and just be there for educational purposes, almost living in a bubble for seven years. Um, I found it very, um, I, I really enjoyed every step of the way. I, I enjoyed the camaraderie with my co-residents very much. I actually found the first few years of being uh, uh, an attending physician uh, more challenging in some ways, um, which I'm happy to um, elaborate on if we have time. Um, my fellowship training was with these two phenomenal, phenomenal people, um, Ed Laws at the Brigham and Paolo Capabianca in Naples, Italy, uh, who um, I, I uh, were both really transformational experiences for me. Um, so after I took my job, um, uh, very similar to Dr. Rao, I did not have a very strong basic or translational research background whatsoever. Um, and I got interested in genomics early on, especially epigenetics. I began some pilot work. Um, uh, one thing that was great for me was I did a KL2 program, which is a master's degree in biomedical investigations along with, uh, uh, it's an early mentored um, program. It's not quite a KOA, or a K23, but it was, it was a, a very good early mentored award for me. Um, we published some of our, our prelim data and then getting an R01 for me was very, very difficult. Um, and I, I wanna just touch on that for a minute because um, you see how, much, how, how we both focused on that. Uh, I applied in 2016, got scored, resubmitted. I applied in 2017, didn't even get scored on an award, applied in 2018 and got awarded reason I bring this up is I almost gave up. Um, and it was a couple people who really motivated me to continue along this journey and reapply. One of them was Greg Zipfel, who's the current chair at Wash U in St. Louis on a single meeting with him. Um, it's amazing how you can influence someone else's life um, when you're in a position to be a mentor uh, um, or even just a conversation. But then one day, Dr. Giannata, my, my boss, ripped out a page from The Economist um, and if you haven't seen this article, for those of you interested in grants and academic research, I, I really recommend it, especially um, for senior residents, junior faculty. Uh, this is a great article um, uh, from The Economist about um, resilience and grit, which I know will be the topic in a couple of weeks. Um, but it shows that um, people who don't get funding on their first or second tries for major awards actually have a better track record down the road. Uh, and so the, the very... Um, the very characteristic of being rejected may, may set you up for success in the future. And I, I, I personally um, can, re that resonates with me. And I, I, I like to pass this on to other people who are going through some of these challenges as well. 
So why do I love neuro, neuro-oncology and brain tumor surgery? Um, number one, we need cures. Uh, you know, it, there's only so many times, it, it, uh, first of all, I can, I can speak, I'm sure, for Dr. Rao and, 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 and Dr. Mukherjee and Dr. Siva Kumar and Dr. Johnson. When you lose patients to glioblastoma, um, it hurts every single time that we don't have better treatments for these patients. It never gets old. Uh, and, um, and so we need cures. We need bright minds. We need people who are invested in not just the technical aspects of the surgery, but what comes along with that. We, we, are, uh, we, we don't have to leave it up to basic scientists to do that, as you heard. We're not just tissue specimen uh, collectors. Um, I, I really like that quote from Dr. Rao. Um, benign tumors, this is something I do a lot of. You can help a lot of people with meningiomas, pituitary tumors, Cushing's disease, acromegaly, uh, schwannomas, et cetera. Um, this is at least half my, my practice. And um, it, the, re- my, the rewards of seeing my post-ops in clinics is just, it's fantastic. It's, um, and, and I enjoy my job more and more every year as time goes by. Um, brain tumor operations are great cases in general. Every brain tumor is different. I don't care if it's another MET or another GBM or another pituitary tumor. They all have their little nuances that you will learn to appreciate. And that's something I learned from Dr. Laws. I got to write a textbook with him as a fellow where we really focus on all the subtle differences of things you can see in the cellar region. And, and I got to appreciate some of the rare tumors and rare lesions that you can find. Um, and, and so every, every day is, a, is discovery uh, as far as I'm concerned in the OR and learning something new. Um, it, it is a lot of variety. Um, the relationship to anatomy is beautiful because it's not normal anatomy. Of course, it's distorted. And, uh, and the cellar region, um, you know, within a few cubic centimeters, you have this, just all this intricate uh, uh, confluence of different systems coming together, which I find still so fascinating all the time. Um, we get to work with a lot of other great specialists, um, obviously radiologists, pathologists, oncology, radiation oncology, endocrinology, ophthalmology, Etc. I really love the minimally invasive and endoscopic aspect of it. Um, that really drives me to, to in, in very small ways, try to contribute or change the field. Um, and I, I think um, in our careers, especially for you young neurosurgeons out there, you're going to see so much cool um, technology and advances into this field. Robotics, immunotherapy, vaccines, we're already seeing a lot of this, targeted treatments, etc. What I love is that you get to develop long-standing relationships with patients and families. That's not the case for all subspecialties of neurosurgery, but I'm sure Dr. Rao will tell you he has patients he follows up with who are 10, 15 years out um, from surgery, and, and those bonds are strong bonds, and I, I, I really enjoy that. Um, I, I briefly considered emergency medicine as a specialty, and I, I just don't think I could do it. Um, it's not who I am, and uh, and so I, I, really, I really love those relationships. Um, just a little bit about what excites me. I've, I've spoken about endoscopy a little. I think it's a major contributor to what we do. And just to see even within a couple of decades how much this has evolved, um, all the contributions of just an instrument like the endoscope. And, and there's so many other examples to this, of course. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but really the, the anatomy you can see with the endoscope, or you can see compartments of the, of the brain that you could not see 20 years ago with a microscope or, or with loops or your naked eye or whatnot. And um, we, we've come a long way. Um, this was the first endoscopy video that I know of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a pituitary tumor in 1962. And over half a century later, you can see how far we've come. Um, still a long way to go. But um, I just think it's, it's cool to see um, these developments um, side by side. Um, so, um, so Dr. Apuzzo used to call this the minimalist march. Um, we see these minimally invasive technologies in, in so many aspects of surgery and neurosurgery, whether it's endovascular or radiosurgery, spine, whatever it is, lit, so many different examples. And, and I now apply the endoscope um, to really half of my cases are, are endoscopic in some way, and the other half are open cases. But um, just some of, the, some of the ways that we use the endoscope for brain tumor surgery um, and really have MIS access to the to so many compartments of the brain now. Um, this is the stuff that excites me. Um, in the future, we're gonna we're gonna definitely see robots um, changing what we do. We're already seeing VR and AR technology, uh, 3D endoscopy. Um, our cameras and instrumentation is only gonna get more uh, more miniaturized. 
Um, so uh, it, it's really a, a, an amazing ride to be part of and also contribute to, um, I think, and, and you can actually help with this. Um, as far as a brain tumor practice, this was our whole department um, in 2018, but just the variety of tumors that we get to treat um, uh, uh, across uh, an adult and pediatric hospital and, and, and the workflow. Um, I, I recently was appointed director of our brain tumor center here a couple months ago, which um, I'm so excited about. Um, just the ability to, to bring a team together and leverage the strengths of all of our um, different scientists and practitioners. Um, so working with all these people is really phenomenal. Um, we, we obviously have a lot of good toys that we get to use in brain tumor surgery and, and the technology is phenomenal. Um, in addition to all the mapping that we get to do and, and the, um, the, uh, all the functional imaging and, and, and advanced imaging um, and awake craniotomies, um, some of the most interesting stuff is the fluorescence um, going on now, as, as you probably know. But, um, uh, you know, just the ability to have 5-ALA is, is only a couple years old for, for, for most of us and is really a game changer in the field. So um, it's just exciting to see um, where this is going to go in the next couple of years. Um, and, and it's exciting to combine some of these technologies um, and interests. Um, it doesn't stop there. Uh, the lab is so critical, as, as you heard, um, and I'm starting to wind down here with, uh, with my talk, but um, this is what we focus on. We focus on genomics as well and really epigenetics and, and more recently single cell sequencing for a variety of, of brain tumors. And, uh, and I think this is where the field is going. Um, in neuro-oncology, um, we're already seeing targeted therapies in precision medicine, advanced uh, uh, multi-omics uh, platforms spatial sequencing, um, immunotherapy is here, and we're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna see a lot of advances with that. Um, different ways of delivering drugs into the brain, robotics, tumor treating fields, so many interesting things that you guys get to be part of and, and help shape. So why an academic job and why is this important? Um, so traditionally brain tumor expertise was confined to academic institutions. Um, this is changing. Um, you're seeing a lot of um, quote unquote private systems where um, uh, people uh, can appropriately be uh, brain tumor specialists and conduct research. Um, so it is possible to be a brain tumor specialist if you're not affiliated with a major university. Um, but why academia? Um, I can tell you why I enjoy uh, being in an academic setting. Um, research, research, research used to be articles, but now we really focus on grants quite a bit. Um, uh, very critical. Um, I love education, uh, um, whether it's working with med students, residents, or, or our fellowship now, which we've had going for three or four years. Um, and then uh, working in a center of excellence, as you heard from Dr. Rao, volume is associated with better outcomes. So really doing something over and over again. And, and I don't do spine surgery or even I don't do vascular surgery anymore either. Uh, but uh, but um, really focusing on, on a few different tumor types, I think, um, makes you better. And then the high caliber of colleagues that we get to work with, uh, et cetera, whether it's um, uh, patient care or research. Um, this is one of my favorite things is working with the residents um, and uh, and. Dr. Mukherjee noticed the, uh, the trophy behind me. We're going on a couple of years here of defending the West Coast uh, Volleyball uh, uh, and uh, Ultimate Frisbee Tournament here. So I have uh, two more slides. Um, this is a patient who is a physician at USC. Um, he's, he's, recent, uh, he's since uh, died of a glioblastoma. And um, I, I had the privilege of being his doctor and getting to know his um, family. Um, he was an internal uh, medicine uh, physician here for many decades and ran uh, the residency program here. And they gave me this gift, um, which was a knight, uh, and they called it the, uh, a knight in shining armor, which is what they said I was to them. Not just because I did his surgery, but because I was doing research. And um, unfortunately, the cure didn't come on time for, for Dr. Goldstein, but I look at this every single day, and it's a reminder of how much we need to do uh, for our patients and our field. And I always ask myself this, um, I don't think we've seen any major watershed moments, maybe a couple minor ones, in, at least in my career, or even may, maybe many of your lifetimes as young, uh, early neurosurgeons. But um, I, you know, I, I know we will see a watershed moment in neuro-oncology um, and with glioblastoma over our lifetimes. So um, uh, here's my favorite quote I wanna leave you with because it does apply to neurosurgery. And when you heard what Dr. Rao said about not chasing the money, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, uh, I slept and I dreamed that life is all joy. I woke and I saw that life is all service. I served and I saw that service was joy. 
uh, Khalil Gibran, um, neurosurgery and is a service industry and, uh, and, uh, and taking care of patients and families with brain tumors is a service industry and should remain uh, that way, um, uh, in my opinion. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for uh, uh, your attention and for having me uh, as part of this uh, great webinar. Appreciate it. Awesome, thank you. My internet went down, so I'm joining you via phone. <laughs> All right, very good. So I just wanted to thank you both for your awesome presentations. And uh, even for me, this I learned something new from each one of these, so it's really amazing. Um, with that, I wanted to open it up for our panelists. Um, I'm sure they have some questions, some comments. Uh, many of them are neuro-oncology doctors themselves, um, but uh, I usually start from most senior to most junior. So who's most senior, Raj or, or, or Wally? I'm not sure. E either one is fine. Wally, why don't uh, you talk about that? <laughs> I, I would just um, thank you both very much. You guys obviously know you played a very large role uh, in my career and life and everything. So thank you. Dr. Zad is actually the one that got me to commit to neurosurgery. Whether that's positive or negative depends on the day, but I always appreciate it. So positive. And, and the haircut more than anything. I'm sorry I went, uh, about that one. That one I won't take credit for. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I'm still trying to grow this beard like Dr. Rao. It's a work in progress. Takes a while, bro. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I would just echo, I mean, the, they both have uh, just gone into the pearls. I think this is the best field in neurosurgery, obviously, but it's the hardest. Uh, I lost the GBM patient after two years, after a, a giant GBM, after a gross total resection. And she died with uh, without any tumor in her brain, at least on imaging. So it, it's just a tough field. It hurts. Uh, you kind of have to take the, the wings and the sources of inspiration when you can. So I would just recommend, there's a lot of talk about this with uh, when you don't have access to those mentors and access to uh, people for the guidance, I would just try to soak up these events, go to all of the meetings that you can be involved in the, in the neurosurgical organizations, um, especially neurosurgical oncologic organizations. Now with COVID, uh, a lot of you are not really getting to experience that, that sort of awe and real high feeling that you get from going to these meetings and meeting these people and hearing these stories like you did today. So just try to soak up all of these webinars, these meetings that actually have made access easier. That's great. Um, I, I'm not sure if you covered it, um, Gabe, but if you please tell me if you did. Um, I have a question, which is, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, you guys are both search and scientists in NH funded uh, basic science labs, which, which is obviously extremely laudable. Um, but for the person who's a you know a junior resident or medical student says maybe I don't want to spend a lot of my time doing science, it's just not my interest. I want to do clinical, um, you know, brain tumor surgery. Uh, you know, that's just my passion. Um, what kind of you know advice would you give those people? What kind of jobs can they expect to find? Um, you know, is, is there a different path in your own that you see as being also uh, virtuous and, and good? within neuro-oncology. Neuro you want me to take that one or Dr. Rao? Yeah, maybe, maybe Gabe, since I think, I, I, I'm not sure if you covered it or not, but, but I, I, Yeah, uh, so, so um, research is a big component if you're gonna be in an academic center. Um, there are so many other models as I, I, I briefly touched on. Um, my fellow from last year, super capable, wonderful surgeon, um, wasn't into the research as much. He took a job at Kaiser Permanente here at, at the big Kaiser Sunset, which is in LA, which is a very high volume center where he's a he's he's the go to brain tumor guy for a lot of those cases now. So, um, uh, you know, there, there are so many different avenues you can take, you can be in a private practice and do everything but, but maybe focus a little more on on brain tumors, or if you're in a, um, a multi multi partner practice, um, you might divide those cases up a little differently or etc. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, you, you don't need to do research. Um, uh, if you want to just do good operations for people and take good care of patients, there, there are ways to do that. It is a little more challenging in, if you want to be a brain tumor specialist to do that, though. Um, the jobs are a little more limited, maybe becoming uh, more available. But, um, but if you're going to do, uh, you know, I, I think if, you're, if you really want to have a lab and focus on the research, et cetera, most of those jobs are at academic institutions. Not all of them, but most of them are. Right. Very good. Uh, I think, Raj, you're up. Hey, uh, thanks. Thanks for mine. Dr. Rao and Gabe, thanks, thanks so much for your time and, and for your insights. I think uh, 
you know, both of you talked uh, for a bit about that time when you're out of residency and, and, a, and a junior attending, and that's where I'm at now. I'm a couple of years out. And, you know, I, I haven't gotten any major funding. I've gotten little, little things. And, you know, sometimes the depression sets in and, 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 uh, and all of that. And so it, it's, you know, I'm still on, a, 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 I think, a trajectory and pathway forward where I'm excited about the work. And, but, um, you know, things do get busy and they've gotten busier and busier and busier clinically. And so I am aware of that clock, you know, that's, that's ticking. And so I guess my question is, it's a, it may not be for the whole group, but at least for the younger uh, folks, how, how do you, how did you sort of slow down the clock and how did you, was it, you know, uh, I, I, I know, like, for instance, I know Dr. Bren mentioned that when he was a junior person, he would sort of, you know, take a couple weeks off and, and have Dr. Carson sort of take his call so he could just do writing. And, you know, that's not a feasible thing uh, for me. Uh, you should just, was, ask, just ask Henry to take your call. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah right. We'll see, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but, but, you know, do, do you guys have any practical sort of insights, tips on, on how to- Well, clean? yeah, I would say that you're in the most difficult part of your career. I mean, that first five years is just the worst because, <laughs> you know, you're the low guy in the totem pole and, and yeah, the clock, you can't slow the clock down, by the way. There's nobody to slow it down. But um, you have to, you know, I don't know if you can ask your senior colleagues to take call for you, but you, you do have to actually make time to write. And, 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 and for me personally, like I, I had to like, dial back my clinic and maybe, maybe, you know, not have an OR day, you know, a couple of days, you know, in a two week stretch. Um, mm -hmm. As, as, as Gabe mentioned, I mean, you know, I had the same issue. Like I submitted a grants and, you know, they get rejected and you're just like, Oh my God, this is never going to work for me. And, and then the worst part is like hearing other people get funded on the first time. And you're just like, Oh, that's great. I'm so happy for you. Right. But but it doesn't happen for all of us. Um, and you ha I have to, I was one of these people that, I, and still to this day, I'm the same way. I mean, you ha I have to put the work in. And what that meant was I would have to cancel clinics or cancel ORs and, and just sit and write. And, you know, you, you just have to figure out a way to do that. And, you know, I know that Dr. Brem is, is, you know, committed to, you know, you guys being successful. You guys have such a great history of people you know, getting funded and, and doing great work. Um, and your chair has to be understanding of that to some extent. Um, but you, nobody's going to hold your hand, right? You, you, you have to make that decision. And sometimes, depending on your model, it could mean that you, you know, you take a hit financially. If you're in a collections-based system, for example, right? You just suck it up and you, you spend time writing and you know that, okay, for that month, things are not going to be that great for you. But you, you, there's no... At the end of the day, it's you, right? Nobody else is going to get that grant finished or that paper finished. And so, but to, to offer you some empathy, it's it, it, you are you are in the worst. Or the, I would say the worst. You're in the most challenging part of your career, right? So, uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. A lot of uncertainty. All right, I think Sakib is next in line. Yes, thank you both so much for your time. It's really great hearing your stories and your thoughts on the field. Uh, you both have touched on some exciting advancements within the field, you know, talking about basic and translational research, then new operative techniques, technologies. So, you know, it's clear this is a subspecialty with a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity and a lot of room for innovation. And so my question is, what advice do you give to trainees who want to be innovators within neurosurgical oncology? Uh, you know, do you have any specific advice on identifying a relevant problem, you know, developing a niche within the field, especially developing a, a nice academic niche and then ultimately enacting some sort of meaningful change? It's a great question. Uh, I, I could try to take it and um, I would love to hear what Dr. Rao has uh, to say as well. Um, it's a more challenging question because it depends if you, uh, there are many ways to innovate, first of all. You can be an innovator in uh, your research, you can be an innovator in technology, uh, you could spin off companies, you could, uh, you could be an IP innovator, you could do devices, you could, um, you could be an educational innovator. Um, there's a lot of ways to innovate and to contribute. Um, I think it depends uh, um, what you're trying to do and which of those. Um, if, it's, if it's your research, then that has a, a more uh, defined pathway. If you want to do more technology-based stuff, um, for instance, devices or, or work with industry, 
Um, a, a lot of that comes from um, just experience, honestly. I, I think um, it, there, it's a whole other world we're not exposed to. You could always, um, you, you know, you could always take courses or, or do an advanced degree, or if you want to go back and do a biomedical engineering degree, you could do that. Uh, or do an MBA or something like that. That's that's all fine. But um, really, with stuff like that, um, developing partnerships with people, um, uh, uh, learning to leverage the strengths of people around you, um, knowing what the the environment is like out there, and um, it, it's a tough environment. Um, developing medical devices is is, is challenging. Uh, um, uh, there are a lot of um, hurdles. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, um, the, the barrier for entry is really, really high. So there's a lot you learn over the years doing that kind of stuff. I think speaking with your mentors who have done that before is a really good way to go, uh, to, to cert, you know, neurosurgeons who have gone down that road. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, it does. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Rao, could you incorporate your, um, as, as, you know, as your, your time and leadership, experience the, the view of neurosurgery's relationship with industry and sort of its acceptance and uh, you know use of responsible relationships with industry to push the field forward maybe loaded question well i mean we are neurosurgery is inextricably linked to technology there's just no you can't do we can't do what we do without you know tech, without companies and so um, it, it's challenging only in that you have to be careful with the relationships you develop. Um, and, and, you know, I think that disclosure is important. Everybody now has to have a disclosure slide and that sort of thing. And now the Sunshine Act, obviously, you can go to openpayments.org and see how much money people are making from industry. Um, but it's not nefarious. I mean, people are legitimately offering up their intellectual abilities to help push the field forward. Um, that ought to be worth something. So I don't look at it as being a negative. Um, you know, there are, there are so many ways now to get, um, to navigate this legally, <laughs> I should say, that, that you shouldn't shy away from these sorts of things. And at the end of the day, you have expertise that I think uh, if a company wants to ask you how to do something, should you be compensated for it? Yeah, I mean, I, I see no problem with that. Um, I think if we ignore industry and ignore technology, we do it at our own peril because, um, you know, I, I think we've been very lucky that endovascular neurosurgery, for example, is something that is really in in neurosurgery. And I think Jeremiah can speak to this. I mean, we've all we we all know that CT surgeons, you know, didn't get involved and they lost that. To cardiologists, and there's no going back. I mean, they're not suddenly going to all become um, endovascularly trained. Whereas we we embrace the technology, and a lot of these trials are being driven by neurosurgeons. You know, um, Jeremiah's been involved with them here, development of devices and that sort of stuff. Um, I think it's very very important. Uh, even in neuro oncology, you know, I've, we've embraced laser interstitial thermal therapy, which has been actually for some patients really remarkable. Um, and so, uh, you know. It's a long-winded answer to your question, but and I would say in the context of organized neurosurgery, um, these you know our societies can't survive without industry support. I mean, they 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 it's like you know they 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 bring dollars to the table to help us put on meetings and, and that sort of stuff, and you have to sort of keep them at arms arms length, but you also need to you know those relationships are important. So um, you know that's there's a way to do it without feeling dirty, I should say. <laughs> I agree. I think everything has to be everything has to be appropriate payment for your time and energy. Uh, you don't want to get into. I mean, the, the pitfall is just some sort of kickback system where you're getting paid for doing cases for them or something like that. But uh, I think in general, it's extremely important. To me, it's what propels our field forward. Actually, is the innovation that is eventually brought to the market by these by these companies. So it's an important relationship to maintain in a I guess in a way of having integrity though. Um. I have one question for you both. If, if you were uh, counseling a PGY3 resident who's thinking about fellowship, he's done fine cranial vascular rotations. Um, what, what, what would the reasons be that you would counsel this person to go into neuro, to neuro-oncology fellowship? Obviously, most people we tell them to follow their interests, but if this person likes all things equally, what, what, is, what is something that you'd say is so rewarding about the field that you would counsel someone to do it? 
Uh, I, I can start. Okay, yeah, we'll start well, with um, uh, happy to start, and then Dr. Zada can finish. The um, I, actually, he touched on it. I mean, there have been some remarkable improvements in neuro oncology. I mean, yes, we have we made very little dent in GBM, but you know, when I was a resident, if you had metastatic melanoma to the brain, you were dead in six weeks, and now five-year survival for stage four melanoma, even with brain mets, is almost 50%. I mean, it's amazing how that has changed. And I think that gives us all hope that there's a signal there for GBM probably, right? I mean, if immunotherapy can, can revolutionize treatment of lung cancer, or kidney cancer, melanoma with, with metastatic disease, surely we can figure out how to do this. Some, maybe not, maybe not, you know, volumab or ipilimumab, but something, something out there may be, may be um, effective. So I, I think you have to have the ability to kind of look beyond the negative, the terrible survival rates for some, for, for some things. And, and, um, and I, I think what Dr. Zada has done, you know, he's, he's dovetailed his clinical interest with a lab interest, right? So his research is in pituitary tumor. That's what his primary clinical interest, I mean, that's really that's really how to do it, is to figure out a way that you can take what you do in the OR back to the lab and, and study it. And so if, if a PGY3 has an interest in doing that, um, I think that that's a great way to kind of jumpstart a career in, in neurosurgical oncology. Yeah, uh, I would echo all of that. I, I, I think I, um, I would go back to the answer you told me not to give. Jeremiah, which is uh, they better be interested in it. If, if they don't want to read and review papers and write grants on the weekends about this topic, don't, don't, don't do it. Uh, that's what it ultimately boils down to. Um, you have to love the operations. And, and as I mentioned, the pathology and, and then, um, it, uh, but I think that's a big one is um, you're going to be spending a lot of your, I don't know what you call it, extracurricular time, uh, 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 reading and writing and being a, a, a you know, wh whatever they call it, thought leader, I don't know, whatever, whatever, whatever nomenclature you want to put on it, but you, um, you know, you'll, you will be, uh, you'll be reviewing papers, you'll be editing your residence papers. So if, if this isn't what you want to think about in your spare time, don't, don't do it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, any, uh, any other questions from the, from the panel? Um, or, we're running up on about time where we usually do our Q&A. We may have one more panel question time. If not, we'll go to Anna for the Q&A. There's some good questions here in the, in the Q&A. All right, let's just do it. Anna, what, what questions are interesting to you? Uh, will you recommend attaining a PhD in order to start up a lab? And if so, how common is it for residents to do this? Um, so, I don't think it's necessary. Like many of my mentors did not have PhDs. Um, however, and that's a long road, obviously. Um, you, have to be, you have to really want to do that. I don't think it necessarily, there, there's some data that it predicts, being MD, PhD predicts a higher likelihood of getting an NIH funding. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, you just have to be, have kind of, you know, it's getting trite now, but you have to have some grit to be able to, you know, want to do it. Um, I will say I've seen a lot of MP PhDs come through who end up going into spine surgery in private practice. <laughs> and I, think it's, yeah. I think it's just because they get, you know, they've been in that rat race and they're, they don't want to do it anymore. And so one of my favorite chief residents when I was a resident was a brilliant guy. He's in private practice in California, just doing a bunch of ACDFs and, and he's happy. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I don't know that it's necessary. It, it, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm probably less inclined to tell somebody to do a PhD um, because I've seen the model work where you haven't, where people haven't done it and have been successful. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, just very briefly, I, I, I think the, the time between a PhD and when you go into practice is a good eight years, uh, if, at least. And a lot of PhDs, um, they're, what, what they're really experts on and what's current and innovative. I mean, these are the keywords for an NIH grant, right? Innovation, et cetera. Um, eight, in eight to nine years, the entire field has transformed usually. Um, so it, unless you can continue it during your residency, which is often challenging, you may be at a different program, you may not be able to set up the, the same lab you had when you were doing your PhD, et cetera. So 
those are some of the, I think, some of the challenges of doing that. Um, I, I think the, the experience is invaluable, but it, um, it's a trade-off. And so it's a very personal question for people. Yeah, and I think I would say, you know, if, if you're thinking about getting a PhD just to have a lab, um, as, as Dr. Zada said, I don't think it's necessary, but I think, you know, most programs do have some protected research time or dedicated research time. And if you want to have a lab, you, you really need to make an effort to go into a lab that's productive. That, this could be a whole other topic, but, you know, I think for somebody who wants to have a research lab, finding a mentor who actually has successfully uh, whose, whose graduates or mentees have actually been able to start up labs is, is important. So find somebody who has actually been able to get somebody's, uh, you know, their, their, uh, a student's career jump started. That's, that's usually a good predictor of success. Yeah, I mean, that holds true in many, many ways for many people when it comes to mentorship. So that's wonderful. Uh, what, any other questions uh, you found, Anna? Yes. Um... Thank you for sharing your story. My question is, what would you recommend for someone who is trying to gain more exposure without a home program for today's application work? Thank you. Probably a good one for I Yeah, I think any of us could take that. Um, we don't have a, yeah, or Dr. Rao, you maybe you want to talk about that one you mentioned earlier that was a... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we see applications all the time now from folks that don't have home programs. It's a challenge for sure. And with the COVID thing, it's even worse because you, you would be able to normally do a sub by. Um, I, I think the SNS has offered some guidance on this that if you don't have a home program, you can rotate somewhere else. Of course, now in this cycle, in this point in the cycle, it's too late. Um, but depending on what year you are, I think it's absolutely critical to have a at least three sub eyes, get good letters, um, go to go to, you know, you know, probably one of the three places you go needs to be a very high powered place like a UCSF or a, a place like that where there's there's just a, you know, it's, it's a known quantity and a letter from there is going to carry a lot of weight. Um, it doesn't mean you can't match, but you, you certainly have a little bit of a disadvantage because you'll be relying on those sub eyes, the letters to, to really help propel your application um, to the top of the pile. Anything to add to that, Gabe? Uh, no, not really. I think I, I think Dr. Rao covered it. Yeah, um, if you don't have a home program, you should be doing su away sub eyes. Even this even this year, I think there are exemptions, as as you mentioned. So uh, yeah, and you really got to get yourself. You have to put yourself out there even more than I think the average applicant essentially. So so Zoom can help you with that, of course. Um, I, uh, uh, Jeremiah, I think we talked about this on your uh, on your on your podcast as well. Um, but in some ways, it's enabled uh, applicants to, to put themselves out there much more. And so um, be outgoing, set up, you know, attend all the opportunities out there um, virtually with different residency programs, and then get to know the residents and set up, set up some meetings with uh, even some of the program directors if, if they're willing to do that. You know, one other thing, especially for, uh, for folks early in medical school, there are summer research opportunities through uh, AANS and NREF that uh, where you get some funding for the summer and you be able to, you know, have a summer research experience at an outside institution. So. It's a great thought. Absolutely. Agreed. All right, Anna, any, anything else in the question base? Yes, uh, for MD, PhD trainees, how would you recommend, how would you counsel them on how to best use the protected time during the graduate school, during graduate school? Uh, publish your work. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean that. Um, we see some PhDs go through without publishing their, their PhD work, and that's, uh, that's always um, slightly a red flag uh, for us. So, um, so, so try to complete what you're working on. Um, that's your goal is to become a scientist during those years. Um, if you want to do extra projects in, in neurosurgery, that's great. I have, a, I have an amazing MD PhD student now at Caltech who's writing, not only working on his thesis, but writing a bunch of neurosurgery articles as well. So if you can balance that, great, but not at the expense of not finishing your PhD work or publishing. Yeah, I agree 100%. There's, there's time um, to do other, if there's time to do other stuff, you, know, you really want a body of work that is maybe even very, you know, varied so that, you know, because people are going to look at you and say, you, you know, notice you spend a lot of time getting your MD and PhD and they'll expect to see a long kind of list of stuff. 
that you accomplished during that time. Excellent. Any other questions, Anna? Yes. Uh, for second years who will be taking the last score step one exam, uh, if will we if we will be taking a research year or two to expand our research experiences and improve our future application, will that year still be considered along with the other applicants who may have a pass fail step one? I think the question was, I think the question is, uh, if you have a score and someone else has a pass fail, uh, because you had some delay between when you took the pass, the step one and when you actually applied, will that hurt you? I don't think anybody knows yet. <laughs> I mean, I think we're all, yeah, we're all dreading this pass fail step one, probably. Um, I, I guess what I would say is doing research, you know, it, it, it's a different, it's, it's, it's hard to put, I mean, I, I hate to say it's a must, but it's almost becoming a must um, because everybody is doing it. Um, but it also shows a commitment to the field. I mean, you know, neurosurgery is one of those subspecialties, I think, in surgery where research is so intertwined with our DNA that, particularly in academic neurosurgery, that it's, it's hard to imagine it not being um, important, particularly after step one goes past fail. So I don't, I don't know how, it'll, how I'd balance your, you know, if, you, if you've got a step one score and you've done research, compared to somebody who has a pass fail step one score and has research. Um, I, I, I don't know how I'm gonna balance the two. I probably would still, if you've got a good step one score, it could make a difference. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, I have a bunch of people looking at applications, so I'm just speaking for myself, but there are, there are you know, I'd, I'd appreciate uh, Dr. Zada's opinion on this because I'm sure he'll have the same. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think anyone knows yet. I, I think we're, we're also, uh waiting to see how that unfolds. I, I think you can't be faulted for it. You know, a strong step one score can help you marginally. A, 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 a low step one score can hurt you much more than a strong step one score can help you. So the pass fail may be a wash. It depends what else you have going on, but it really speaks to the fact that of how, how, how big of a, a role research is gonna play as a differentiating feature among applicants, I think. Yeah, I think that's interesting. We've also had this discussion uh, briefly on another webinar, and I, I do think that the that particular panel said that if you're going to stop and do a year of research, that that year of research better be productive. Um, so it, that's another very interesting topic that, that Dr. Rao kind of briefly touched on is whether or not to take a year of research. Um, so just another thing to keep in mind. Uh, any other questions, Anna? Yes. Um, is it feasible to have an academic career without a basic basic science lab? If so, what would you recommend I do during residency and fellowship to facilitate an easy path to such a career? Thanks. Uh, I think yes, definitely. Uh, you can absolutely have an academic career without a basic science lab. There are many ways to do that. Um, uh, you, you can have a strong clinical practice and, and, and write up clinical outcomes. You can do uh, um, educational work. You can collaborate with basic scientists and not have your own lab. Uh, you could do none of the above. You could do policy. You could um, you could be a program director. There's so many ways to still be academic and not have a lab. Yes, is the answer. Yep, and we actually so we have you know, we again we have three to four fellows a year in neurosurgical oncology, um, who rarely have labs actually, but but many of them are able to get jobs where they're doing mostly oncology and it's mostly clinical work or or as. Dr. Zada said they have another piece that's maybe educational or, or something else. Dr. Rao, a uh, quick question. It's a little plug for the organized traveling fellowships with all the technology that Dr. Zada was bringing up. Yeah, you know, if one place you don't get all of that experience, um, could you talk a little bit about the, the, the utility of those traveling fellowships that are present for both WNS and I think CNS as well? Uh, do you mean like now in the area of the pandemic or, or what do you mean? No, no. I mean, so just, I don't think many of the, the viewers here know if you don't have access to all of the different technology and things at your home institution, or even in your own practice as a young neurosurgeon, uh, the traveling fellowships, which they have in all of the different subspecialties, cerebrovascular, PH tumor, um, 
Do you think those are useful? Yeah, I do. In fact, one of our residents is doing the PEDS one. It got held up because of the pandemic, but she's going to go to Toronto for, I think, a month. Um, yeah, I think they're incredibly valuable because anytime you can see how somebody else does something, it, it, um, it's, it, it's very valuable. In fact, I, I like seeing how other people operate on things. So um, mm -hmm. no question that, that that's a, a very useful um, opportunity. Um, I wanted to ask one more quick question, and we're going to have to close uh, close close up the, the session. But um, you both uh, very interestingly have NH funded labs um, with no PhD. Um, if you are early in your residency training or even a student looking at programs, um, what are you looking for to allow you to have the mentorship to make that happen? If you're interested in that, the time and mentorship. But you need to have two particular years uh, you know, to do labs work in the middle of your life. I see your question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, you want to make sure that you have an appropriate mentor or someone that could serve as one, number one, uh, or at least a, even several mentors, I would say. Um, uh, so someone who's, who's doing, who's currently doing that or they're where you want to get to and who's been down that road. Uh, it, it, there are varying models for protected time, um, and, and what years, uh, they go through. I, I, I you know, I think, um, middle of the road residency or even a little later is, is a little better than the ones that have PGY two or three uh, years off. I think it's too early in the program to know what you want to do personally. So we're, uh, we have protected time during our fourth, uh, fifth and, and our sixth year is fully protected now. So a lot of residency programs are changing because of new requirements and, and, and possibly doing a seventh year uh, in folded fellowship year and making the sixth year a chief year. That's a dynamic that we have to see how it plays out, and it, it will affect uh, what, where the protected research time is as well. So um, there's a lot in flux. Uh, I don't think it matters that much as long. I think the mentorship is more important than than exactly when or how much protected time you have, as long as you have enough during your your residency. I think I think the main point of residency is to learn to operate and and come out as the most capable neurosurgeon, um, and then you you can reconnect with your research or like Dr. Rao and I really learn a lot of it after residency, essentially. Uh, um, but it, uh, but neurosurgery it, uh, residency training is for is for becoming a neurosurgeon, um, and uh, and I, I think most people adapt to what that, that research time is. I'd I'd love to hear what Dr. Rao thinks as well. Yeah, I know I agree with everything you said. I think that you know for me personally, it was a two year commitment that was pretty well protected. Um, I can say I don't think I would have been a. a, a kind of the candidate I was just to have, you know, a chair put faith in me that I could start a lab if I had not done that. And I also had papers during those two years. So there's a lot of things that have to come together. And I had a great mentor. So um, all those things, if you want a lab, I think those things have to sort of coalesce in a way. Because um, I think as a chair looking for to hire people, if you say you did two years in a lab, but there are no papers from those two years, or there's no like product, no metric for productivity, then it makes me wonder, you know, what if I protect you or if I give you a lab or startup funds, I really have no sense that you're going to be able to do anything. So, and I totally agree with it. It's better to come later in the residency because uh, then you're closer to the science that's on the cutting edge. You know, four years can change so much um, in terms of science that I think doing it early on is actually a disservice. All right, thank you both very much for coming. I think that's pretty much all the time we have. Um, absolutely outstanding, both, both talks and the discussion. I hope it was very helpful to everyone. Um, thank you for all the listeners. Please don't, don't forget to look for the, please remember to look for the uh, survey, which you, if you were part of one of the first five webinars, you should have gotten in your email this week. Um, please fill that out, it's very helpful to us. Um, next week, we will have off the week after. On Thursday, we have the Grit and Resilience Neurosurgery Training, um, which we're all looking forward to. And um, I appreciate our guests and panelists coming tonight and spending this time with us. This will be up on YouTube. It usually takes about three or four days for it to get loaded. We'll announce it on social media. And appreciate you all coming. And uh, have a good night the rest of the evening.